the year is 1980X, and you just bought yourself your first Atari 2600 home console. You were so excited that you dusted off your shitty VHS camera and you filmed yourself marveling at this glorious machine. And you're probably wondering to yourself, I spent hundreds of dollars on this? I probably could have wiped my ass with it and it would have been money more well spent. Well, I have good news. The Atari 2600 is not just a paperweight. It actually plays games. And I have several of them. And I'm going to review and rank all of my Atari games because I happen to actually really love the Atari 2600. And I happen to love the games on it. And so, I don't know, I thought I would take the time to show people a good picture of what the Atari 2600 actually is, and what it actually has to offer. So basically, I'm not going to review my multiplayer games because I don't have anybody to help me record that right now, So because I have no friends. So basically, I'm going to show you all my single player games, which is 22, and I'm going to rank them in order from worst to best. And I'm going to give little reviews, and I'm going to let you know if I recommend it. So basically, this is an Atari 2600 mega review. It's going to be very long, it's going to be very boring, it's going to be very painful. You're going to sit through my shitty jokes. So without further ado, here is my mega review of the Atari 2600. Pole position is pretty boring, to be honest. Easily the worst... Atari game that I have because I think you can possibly beat it by just holding nothing or by holding forward or whatever. There is so little to this version of pole position and I've played the plug and play arcade version of it and that is a fun game but this is not. Honestly there's only one redeeming factor to this entire game. And it's that kick-ass background. I mean, look at that. They, they put some effort into that background. I mean, they got the, the triangles with multiple layers of triangles with different colors. And they got the blue sky. And they got clouds, actual clouds. That's pretty advanced for an Atari game. I mean, it's advanced uh, for a first grader using MS Paint, too. But overall... It's a really boring game to play, which saddens me because the arcade version is pretty great. Uh, I recommend the arcade version. I don't recommend buying this version unless you're a huge fan of the arcade version and you just need to have the shitty Atari crap out version where they just at pole position ate like a nasty ass sandwich and then shout out Big Turd and they, they slapped a label on it and it called it a port. That's basically what this is. Fuck this game. Fuck everything. Alright, so this is skiing. And I mean, just look at it. It's probably the greatest game of all time. Um, so, the objective of this game is that you're a red man with very long feet. And you're trying to avoid getting your dick impaled by these flags that some asshole put up on your mountain. So, if you make it to the bottom of the mountain without getting your dick impaled, then you win a prize. And the prize is that you wasted 40 seconds of your life. In all honesty, it's not that bad, but it's still pretty bad. So this is... Haunted House. Um, it's a horror themed Atari game, and I mean, it's definitely the scariest game I've ever played. I don't know about you, but I mean, I shat my pants before I even played it. That's how scary this game is. Um, the objective of this game is to walk around as this pair of floating eyeballs living inside of this void of loneliness and despair and uh yeah you collect objects and then you put them down and then you pick them back up because you realize that you probably need them for something but you have no idea what that's the scary thing about this game that's what really sells the horror is you have no idea what's going on you have no idea what you're supposed to do you're just lost you're just lost in this 
horrible field, this horrible plane of existence between reality and the next world. And yeah, it's definitely a great game. I mean, doesn't this look like fun? My favorite character is, uh, I like to call him Ghosty. He's this little ghost that flies around and, I mean, pretty terrifying, if I were to admit. Uh, but honestly, he's probably just as scared of you as you are of him. In fact, he's probably more scared of you. Ghosty has a reason to be scared because you're a pair of fucking floating eyeballs walking around staring at him. I mean, maybe he wants to use the bathroom. Maybe he's trying to look for the bathroom and there's this pair of floating eyeballs watching him. Imagine if you were in the middle of a dark house and then you see this pair of floating eyeballs staring at you. You would be scared too, especially if it was following you. Especially if it could glow in the dark. So yeah, I mean, I feel bad for Ghosty, but I mean, he totally sells this game. I love this game. Um, is it the best game of all time? Yes. Is it the best game on the Atari? Well, it's only number 20. Alright, so this is Asteroids, or as I like to call it, Ass. Uh, it's the arcade classic. Um, fun fact, this is the first Doritos-sponsored video game, seeing as how you're a flying Doritos ship, and you're blasting uh, all these different potatoes flying around just minding your own business. This is propaganda against potato chips. Fuck you, potato chips. It's all about corn chips. It's all about tortilla chips. And so, that's the basic message of this game. Uh, and also something about space, I guess. So, you're blasting asteroids, like, which seems kind of pointless, because asteroids aren't really a threat. I mean, they're a threat in this game, but in real life, like, what do asteroids do? They just float around. You would have to go out of your way to get caught in an asteroid field, so... I don't know. And then you shoot peas at them, and that somehow makes them explode, so those must be some really powerful peas that you're shooting. Uh, but yeah, it's not too bad, but it's overall kind of boring. I have i don't know if I've ever played the arcade version of this game. I've played a lot of classic arcade cabinets before, but I don't know if I've ever actually played the arcade version of this. Um, it is one of the older arcade games in existence, so it does deserve some respect for that, but honestly, it doesn't age super well. Uh... And so it's mild entertainment, but definitely not, like, a must-have, especially for the Atari system. Like, if you're looking to collect games, unless unless you're trying to get every arcade classic, if you're just looking for the games that are a lot of fun, I would say pass on this one. So this is Freeway. It's basically a multiplayer Frogger. Uh... I said I wasn't going to do any of my multiplayer games, but I had to make an exception because this game is just so fantastic. Um, so, there's a debate that me and people who I've played this with have had about this game. Uh, is the character thing we're looking at, is it a chicken, or a rabbit, or a kangaroo? Um, my answer is kangaroo because I think that's a lot funnier, and also because I like to imagine that this game takes place in Australia. Um, so, this game basically tries to answer the age-old question of, why did the kangaroo cross the road? Um, and it answers it by saying, well, because it fucking wants to die. Um, so yeah, the goal of the game is to walk across, and uh, there's different game modes, but I'm too lazy to show them. Uh, it's actually pretty fun in general when you're playing with a friend for about two minutes, but by Atari standards, I guess that's pretty average. Uh, so the one thing about this game that's really annoying is that second player has a huge advantage i mean right here i'm doing a lot better because my second player was nobody and also because uh king this other kangaroo is probably just completely dead inside and just has just has given up on life i mean this this first kangaroo is like i'm gonna make it I'm gonna make it to the other side even if it kills me. I'm I'm ready. I have ambition. This is my life and I'm taking it in my own hands. But the other kangaroo is just like, fuck this. I'm done. Life is over. I'm just gonna sit here and die. 
I'm just gonna lay here on the road. I mean, if you ask me, it's, since it's a 2D perspective, they're not really standing up. They're more just laying on the ground and kind of... He's kind of pushing himself with his legs, you know? That's that's basically what this game is. Um, so yeah, it's actually pretty fun, but the second player has a huge advantage because the cars at the start move at a rate where you don't really have time to avoid them on the left side, but if you're on the right side, then it's pretty easy to avoid because you can see them coming, so... Once you get to the other side, it, sh it you would think it would balance it out, but for some reason it just kind of doesn't, like... It's just generally a lot easier for a second player, which honestly is kind of a relief because a lot of games prefer the first player and make it easier for the first player, but this game's got my back. I always had to play second player. Everybody would always give me the shitty controller and make me play on the shitty uh, second player slot. So no, this is my revenge. This is my game. But then here I'm playing first player, so you don't get to see me have my minute of glory. But the other player sucks, so, you know, at least I got something. Alright, so this is Space Invaders, the true classic. Uh, pretty much the first shooter game in existence. Um, yeah, uh, it's a pretty fun game sometimes, but it is so monotonous. Uh, you play as a nipple and you're lactating into the mouths of these various aliens. Uh, and yeah, it is one of the more sexual games that I've played. I don't know why they call it Space Inv- oh, oh, get it? Space Invaders? Yeah, I get it now. Um, so yeah, it's probably one of the grosser games on the list, but it's still a lot of fun. Uh, I'm really bad at it, <laughs> as you're seeing right now, so I can't really put it that high because I like games that I can play endlessly, and when you suck shit at a game, then you're spending, you're endlessly sucking shit if you uh, suck shit, so I suck shit. My favorite thing about this game is I like to, like, pick which alien is my favorite, and my favorite is probably the eyeball with legs, or maybe it's an asshole with legs. Uh, he looks pretty chill. The rest of them look kind of, you know, they're all right. I like the guy at the top with the antenna, antennae, that they flop around like he's doing a dance. He's doing like a disco dance. He's like disco stew. He's doing this pointing out, and then he's pointing out the other direction. Like, yeah, this is... This is my jam. He's jamming to this beat that they're doing, and actually they do do a beat. Like, when they get lower down on the screen, they start doing this rhythm, and I think that's a lot of fun. Uh, overall, pretty good game. It's my mom's favorite uh, arcade game. It's probably my mom's favorite video game ever, so this is mom material, I guess. Uh, I find it pretty boring after a while, but... If you're into monotony and just doing the same thing over and over and over again, then this is the game for you. Space Invaders, check it out. So this is Pitfall. It's um, the greatest story ever told. It's a true epic. It's the Uncharted of the Atari 2600. It's the Indiana Jones of the golden era of video games. It is a masterpiece. And it's kind of boring, honestly. It's not a whole lot of fun. It's an early platformer, and I love platformers, but it's not a particularly great platformer. It's just, uh, this is a trial and error thing. It's like, this was an experiment, and it's not the best results, but it paved the way for better results that came later. Um, part of the thing that I don't like about Pitfall is that when you go onto a new screen, it resets the screen. Uh, there wasn't really scrolling screens. There, most games just kind of took place on one screen before this. Uh, so it is pretty innovative that you can go across multiple screens in general. Um, I mean, I don't remember the history of games that, from this era, so there probably were games before this that did that, but despite that, it, it for the time, this is pretty unique, I would guess. But... You know, then Super Mario Bros. came out and had a scrolling screen that didn't have to reset every 
30 feet. Like, can you imagine being Pitfall John or Larry or uh, Maximilian? I'm going to call him Maximilian. That's his name now. Imagine being Maximilian and your wa and like your field of view. Okay, our fu field of view is different from Pitfall Maximilian's point of view. So his point of view, it's like imagine if he was sharing our point of view, he would be seeing, you know, 30 feet ahead of him and then nothing. And then he would walk 30 feet ahead and then oh shit, crocodiles like every time the screen resets our vision resets, which becomes kind of a nuisance, but they fix that by having all the obstacles be in the middle of the screen, which makes it positively boring to play, because when all the obstacles are in the middle of the screen, there's not really any threat besides, you know, crossing the obstacles, but in general, that's not a very compelling game idea to me. Uh, so that's why I find it kind of boring, is because... It's so primitive as a platformer that it doesn't have any of the things that make a platformer, like, enduring. It's more just, you play it once, you turn it off, you do something else. It's not It's not an Atari game that I would say is, like, a must-have, but if you find it for a dollar, then it's worth it. And I found it for a dollar, and it's worth it, so there you go, Pitfall, Maximilian, the greatest hero of our time. Jumping on crocodiles' heads with no fear and no remorse. And then he falls into water and dies because he sucks. Battle Zone! So, this is Battle Zone. Um, it's actually a lot of fun. Uh, it's a first person game, which you don't see a lot of in early development in games. I've seen the arcade cabinet, but I don't recall if I ever actually played it. I had a chance to play it, and I think I passed. This is actually, it actually looked better than the arcade version. The arcade version is vector graphics, and this is, you know, there's actual colors and stuff. Uh, I like this game. It's pretty hard, actually, because the thing that makes it frustrating is when something shoots at you, it is near impossible to dodge, and part of that is the controls. And part of that is the controller. Uh, the Atari joystick just does not... It's not very responsive. You just kind of have to jerk it around, like, you know, jerk it. Uh, so... The game's actually pretty fun. It's especially fun if you just drive forward and just pl plumb pl bleh, through everything that you see. Uh, just anything that gets in your way, just mow it down. Until you die, but I actually like the graphics on this a lot. That's part of what makes it a lot of fun. It's just, it's an interesting environment because it's like two dimensions, but it's 2.5D, but it's really early 2.5D. And I actually like 2.5D in general. Doom is probably my favorite game of all time. And this is a precursor to Doom and, and first person shooters. And there's just something really interesting about it. Like when I look at, for example, the, uh, the background, the the brilliant, masterfully, artistically done MS Paint background, it's kind of inspiring because it's like, this looks so shitty by today's standards, but somebody made this in a time where this was hard to make. And that's cool to me. Like, I, I, it, it tells me that I could make a video game. And I have made a video game, and it was shit. But Battlezone's pretty cool, and um, it's hard. All the games that I have, most of them were about a dollar, so it's not exactly like I'm paying out the ass for a game like this, so if you're able to find dollar deals and Battlezone is one of the games that you see, I definitely say buy it, but I mean, it's not like it's a masterpiece, it's just a fun little game. You, you play as a tank and you shoot peas out of your pee hole, and that's all it is. So this right here is GORF! Um, it's basically Galaxian. I don't remember Galaxian too well, but it looks a lot like it and it plays a lot like it. Uh, this is the second on this list of space shooters. Space Invaders started that, and the space shooter genre has gone on for so long, and has had so many games, uh, 
My introduction to the space shooter genre was actually the Nintendo 64 version of Space Invaders. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll review that game someday, but for now I'm talking about GORF! I like to call it that because when I hear the word GORF, I just, it sounds like barf, but it also sounds like something Goofy would say, like GARSH. So I like kind of combine the two, like barfing Goofy. So this game's barfing Goofy. Um, it's fun actually, it's a lot of fun. Uh, not my favorite space shooter on this list, we will get to that later, but it is certainly one of the more fun Atari games. Uh, the way that you shoot is kind of weird because you can repeatedly shoot and it just resets your shot, which doesn't make any sense logically, but in terms of gameplay, it's an interesting idea. It's also an annoying idea at times, but then again, I think it's preferable to Space Invaders where you have to wait for your shot to reach the end of the screen before you get to fire again. So there's four levels of this game. The first level is basically Space Invaders. The second level is a lot more like, I guess, Galaga or Galaxian with the, with the weird formations. The third one... It's like you're fighting a fleet of TIE Fighters that are off in the distance, which is pretty weird. And the fourth one is a boss battle, which is so weird to see in an Atari game. The boss battle is probably the easiest one, though, because you only have to avoid one shot, and it stays in, and it, it's just this big block, and you just shoot it a few times, and it's done. So, overall, the game's pretty fun, but it doesn't have a lot of longevity where you can just play it over and over again. Once you beat it, you're like, well, that's a game. So, yeah, Gorf. Gorf! Uh, check it out. I am so fucking upset. Look what they did to you, donkey. My boy. Donkey dude. They fucked you up. You look like crusty gorilla ass now. Look at this. It's just shit. He's the color and consistency of shit. I'm so sorry, Donkey Kong. You deserve so much better than this. So this is Donkey Kong. It's, um... It's the classic we all know and love. It's a port. It's a port of my favorite arcade game ever. And they managed to really fuck it up. So in this version, you're jumping over cookies, and you're wearing a red onesie instead of overalls. And, uh... Donkey Kong looks like ass. The whole game looks like ass. I mean, look at this. Look at this right here. Look at the quote-unquote AI. That needs a million quotes. Look at the AI on these flame buddies. They're, it's like they're just moving back and forth. That's all they're doing is they just move back and forth. And occasionally they'll just randomly switch directions, which is pretty annoying. But, like, this went from being a really fun level to being the most boring and mundane and easy thing in the world and it's almost like it's just frustrating because I'm totally on board with the idea of an Atari port of Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong is my favorite arcade game ever and they just butchered it which is so weird because it's not hard to get right. I guess maybe the Atari is more limited than I thought but like there's plenty of examples of arcade games that were done well, and this just is not. And I want this to be my favorite Atari game, because it's my favorite arcade game, but instead it's just... I mean, it's it's fun for a while, but it's... Overall, it turns into garbage after you beat the first two levels, because, well, that's all there is. There's no... Uh, there's no 75 meters, there's no uh, springboard elevator level, and there's no uh, pie factory level. And those are some of the best levels in Donkey Kong. And then there, all of the, the elegant nuance of the arcade version is just done away with in this version. You just play the same two levels over and over again, and it just never stops, and the levels aren't even fun because... Look at this, they're... <sighs> They don't even have an animation of any kind. It's just ugly to look at. It's just pretty, like, terrible. And, of course, this is mostly just disappointment, which is why I'm complaining, because it's not that bad. It's just that be 
Because I've already played Donkey Kong, the actual arcade cabinet, as well as the port on uh, Donkey Kong 64, which I used to play regularly. Because I've already played that, this is such a step down. And of course, Atari ports are always a step down on some level, but not to this degree. And honestly, when people talk about how Pac-Man is the worst video... Pac-Man 2600 is the, the worst video game ever made. Um, I think Pac-Man is a better game than this. Than this port. Uh, but I'll get to that soon. My my point is, this just... I'm fine with it looking like ass. That's part of the charm of Atari 2600. But it just plays like ass. That's the problem, is it just doesn't play very well. It just... It's monotonous. And that's the biggest crime any game can have for me, is being too monotonous. And... That's why I liked the DK Arcade game, is because it wasn't monotonous for an arcade game. There was a variety to it, and the variety is basically gone here, and that's why this kind of annoys me, because I, I was like, when I was planning to do this review, I was thinking Donkey Kong was going to be in my top five, and now it's so low after I've actually like sat down and played it thoroughly, because there's so little to it. It's like laughably bad how the the flame buddies work in this level, and then, I don't know, I mean, the barrel level's alright, but it's just the barrel level, it's the standard, and it honestly doesn't change after maybe the second time through. I think it just, the pattern becomes predictable, and then you don't have a reason to keep playing, because there's no way you can game over, because if you can beat the first two levels, you just do that over and over again with no shift in the gameplay. So... It's fun if you want to play two levels of the arcade version that are piss-poor versions, which I'm a sucker. I actually kind of want to do that, so I still enjoy playing this for what it is, but it is far from the best Atari game next game. So, Fantastic Voyage is a game that doesn't actually look like it's that much fun, but it turns out that it's a lot of fun. Um, so I guess this is a shmup. Uh, the game that this reminds me the most of for some reason is Silver Surfer. There's a specific level of Silver Surfer that it reminds me of, and I know that Silver Surfer gets a lot of hate, but I actually like that game a lot. It's probably my favorite shmup. Uh, and this is a really good shmup. It's based off of the movie, which I haven't seen, but I like this one because, first of all, the, the setting is fun because you're inside of someone's asshole, and secondly, uh, I really like just the way that, first of all, the, the heartbeat aspect of it really adds to the tension when you're actually playing, and then the fact that the level keeps shrinking and shri shrinking, I really like that. It, it's a fun concept, I don't know, I I found it pretty entertaining when I was playing through it. So overall, like, it looks pretty shitty, but it's actually really fun. So I definitely recommend Fantastic Voyage. Dodge'em. This is one of the most interesting games on the Atari. Um, I don't know if people ever still talk about it, but... This game was my contender for worst game on the Atari until I figured out how to play it. But once I figured out how to play it, it actually became one of my favorite Atari games. So, the goal of the game is you pick up these pellets on the ground, and you, I guess you're a car, because you sound like a car, and you have to keep changing lanes to avoid this asshole who wants to kill you for some reason. He just has a death wish. He, he just wants to crash in you like, fuck this life, I'm done. I'm gonna crash into this orange guy and take somebody out with me. Go out in a blaze of glory. That's what this guy has. He just has a death wish and he wants you to be involved. He is the epitome of an asshole in a game. If you want to talk about worst villains in games, here you go. Number one, blue car, asshole, worst villain ever. And... I don't know, it's like, what the fuck is this? This is such a weird premise for a game. Try to not get hit by this guy who just wants to hit you. That's just weird to me. Um, I mean, who knows, maybe for, for all I know, like, it turns out that you're the asshole, and he's just, you know, 
you know, he's just going about his day. He's just driving normally through the streets of, I don't know, this is probably L.A., given the traffic, given the, uh, given the driving style of the people. It's probably L.A. Uh, so, here you are, you know, here he is just minding his own business, just driving. And then you're speeding around trying to pick up all this shit on the ground, and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm just here having a good time. I'm just here relaxing, and here you are being a maniac. And maybe maybe he's trying to stop you. Maybe he's trying to teach you a lesson about not speeding. So yeah, the game is actually really hard, and it's really frantic. When you play it, it's like you really feel as though any second you're going to lose. And so you're just... You're, you're, you're simultaneously strategizing how to beat it, and, you know, being, being, like, you're, you're strategizing where to go to avoid him while also having to keep track of where he is, and you're also, you know, trying to boost and trying to control how much you boost, and it becomes this mind game where your entire, all of your brain is functioning at high levels to try to make this happen. It's actually a really hard game. It doesn't look that hard, but it's actually very hard. The thing about it, though, is the unfortunate thing is there's only one level. It's just this. It's just this on repeat. And to a degree, I'm fine with that because I one of my favorite games is Helicopter Game. You know, the uh, internet game with the green lines and you're the helicopter and you just it just never ends. I like games that never end, and I like that this is basically you just repeat it over and over again. I think that's a fun arcade concept. It's just that, what, I'm only going to play it for five minutes. So, it's a great game for five minutes. Um, if you haven't played it yet, you will play it and say this is probably the worst game ever. It's, it's Dick the Game. Um, but... When you actually get used to it, it's a lot of fun. So I do recommend Dodge M. Dodge M. Pac-Man. Alright, so anybody watching this is probably like, What the fuck? Putting Pac-Man above skiing, the greatest game of all time? How dare you? You're probably wondering, how dare I put Pac-Man so high on the list, right? Because Pac-Man on the Atari is the worst game ever made. Game trailers put in their top 10 like eight years ago or whatever. Sure, okay, fine. It's the worst game ever. But here's the thing. It's not actually that bad. It's a pretty enjoyable Atari game. When you own 20 Atari games, it is fun. It's, I mean, it looks like shit compared to the arcade version, but it's still Pac-Man. The same essentials of what makes Pac-Man what it is are still there. I mean, they improved on it in some ways, because the ghosts are finally invisible in this one. No, but really, uh, I think it's fun. I mean, I know it looks terrible. I know Pac-Man looks like he put on a lot of weight or something. He looks like... He got really bad plastic surgery that got botched. He's got a Mickey Rourke face. He looks like Mickey Rourke. He's like Packy Rourke or whatever. I know. I know it looks bad, but actually when you play it, it's basically just a home port of Pac-Man. And I love Pac-Man. I like Miss Pac-Man a lot more, but I don't have Miss Pac-Man for the Atari because I'm pretty sure it's kind of hard to find. I would love to get Miss Pac-Man for the Atari, though, so if anybody wants to send it my way, I'm totally on board. But really, overall, Pac-Man is actually pretty fun. It's Pac-Man. It's you, you collect little squares in this version, and you pick up the power squares, and you eat the invisible monsters, and... and then you just do that over and over and over and over and over again, and... I mean, the original Pac-Man wasn't that amazing. Miss Pac-Man's way better, but with Pac-Man, the Atari version, I mean, it's it's shit compared to the arcade version, but it's not shit compared to other Atari games. So, by those standards, this does belong this high on the list. It's not a bad Atari 2600 game. It's a bad port. It's arguably a bad Pac-Man game. But it's not a bad Atari game. Venture. So, 
I'm assuming that most people watching this have no idea what Venture is. I had no idea either, but I have it, and when I first played it, it was my first exposure to it, and, I mean, look at it. Isn't it great? You can't even see, you're such a tiny dot, you can't even see where you are until you get inside these little rooms, and then you turn into Meatwad from Aqua Teen Hunger Force, and you have a little pea shooter, and then you shoot these things, that's like... The capture is um, really low brightness, so you can't even see what I'm shooting at, but the things that you're shooting at are such creative little blobs. One of them looks like Totoro, one of them looks like a guy with two heads, but the heads are eyeballs, and I think these ones are snakes, but look at them, they're like completely <laughs> motionless, they just, they just kind of maneuver around like they're slipping around on ice. I love it. Um, this is a fun game. I like the- it's actually a really hard game, but it's really- there's only two levels, so once you beat it, it's basically you just repeat over and over again. Um, when I first played it, I saw Adventure and I was like, oh, so it's like Adventure. And then I realized it's a lot more like Berserk, but a little different from Berserk. Definitely not as good as Berserk, but we'll get there. Um, but overall, I- like this game a lot. It's actually really entertaining. It's hard because the movement, the way that you fire is by aiming in the direction that you want to shoot with your joystick, which means you have to be moving in order to be shooting in that direction. Oh, right here, it's like you're inside of a uterus. That's what it looks like to me. Um, oh, maybe that's what this is. Maybe it's a metaphor for conception. You're, you're the sperm and you're entering inside of the uterus right now, and birth happens, and uh, you give birth to, I don't know, insert joke here. So what happens is you just go inside these little four holes, and you avoid these asshole space invaders that you cannot kill. Uh, it's really hard to tell where I am on the screen right now, but basically you just do this. That's all it is, but it's the challenge of it that makes it fun. Ultimately, Atari games don't have very long, like, playability, but this one is short and sweet, and for what little there is, it's a lot of fun. So it's not the best, it's only number nine on this list, but we're moving on because there's some pretty good games coming up. Defender. Again, this is a port of another space shooter classic. That's a running theme of good Atari games, is that they're all ports of space shooters. But the arcade version, I've played it, I think, once. And I think you use a trackball for it. You use a, you know, like the one for Marble Madness, like one of those. I think. I don't remember. But I've played it once, I believe. But either way, in the real version of Defender, the controls are really complicated for a game of this kind, and this game, they streamlined the controls. I mean, you talk about streamlining in modern gaming, look at it all the way back in the 80s, early 80s, streamlining an arcade control. They boiled it down to the simplest version of it, and I think that's pretty cool. I'm, I admire looking into the past and seeing that kind of thing, like, they had to simplify because they only had a joystick and a button, so they did that. And the controls are slightly different, and they're, honestly, they make it easier, but the heart, the challenge made Defender more fun, so that's just, you know, my view. So if, if you don't like the controls of Defender, this might actually be a better game to play than the arcade version of Defender. Regardless, you float on top of this abandoned apocalyptic city, is what it looks like, and you shoot these assholes that want to abduct your your townsmen. They want to abduct your, your peasants. They want to set fire to the village. And you're saying, no, I don't want any of that. I'm having none of that. I'm the defender, and I'm here to defend. And so you just shoot this laser, and you shoot them. <laughs> it's a shooter. It's a space shooter. What more is there to say? Uh, what's interesting is the scrolling screen. I like the m mechanics there. And of course you have the freedom of movement of movement that you don't get to see as much in shooters. Uh, the, 
the movement is like a uh, different different viewpoint of asteroids kind of so this is almost like space invaders combined with asteroids and asteroids is pretty low on the list space invaders is pretty low on the list but combining the two you end up pretty high on the list this is a really fun game I didn't like it super a whole lot at first but when I finally got into the groove of playing it it became addicting and that's what most of the next games on my list will be is cases where the more you play it, the more you like it. And so Defender is definitely a game I recommend. We're getting, we're starting to get into the point where the games that we're talking about are games that I would recommend to anybody looking into having an Atari. And this is one of the first games where it's like, if you have an Atari, get this. So Defender is great. Next game. Adventure, I finally get to talk about this game. I love this game so much. I I love this game. So, you're looking at it. Adventure. What an adventure, huh, right? Look at me, I'm, I'm carrying a sword. It's just the yellow arrow. Oh, watch, watch, I'm gonna kill this dragon. Fuck this guy, fuck him. Yeah, let's get him. Come on. Come on, dragon. Suck it. Ooh, he turned into a duck. Oh, oh, fuck. Got him. He tricked me. He tricked me for a bit. I thought he was gonna die. But he didn't. He survived. Anyways, Adventure is a very fun early adventure game. It's what it is. You're a little tiny dot. You're a little square. And oh shit, shit. Oh, another, another dragon. He looks kind of like a seahorse. Watch out for the yellow dragon. Do not wake the sleeping yellow. Oh, fuck. I hit him with the back end of my sword right in the dick. Oh. Anyways, I love this game so much. I could just gush about it. This game is an early adventure game prototype. It's a lot like... Um, it's basically the Atari version of Legend of Zelda. And the NES Legend of Zelda is one of my all-time favorite games. I love the idea of an early free roaming game and this is one of the earliest free roaming games that i know of and that is just i love it feels so it feels truly adventurous because it's not just adventurous for the player it's adventurous for the creators because they didn't really have a precedent they didn't have something beforehand where they could they could draw from an earlier game and say we're gonna rip this off zelda ocarina of time had multiple zelda games to build off of on top of adventures so all the ideas that we see in modern games came from somewhere, and a lot of them trace back to games like this. So when you go back and play games like this, it's like I put myself in the mindset of the creator, and I just think, oh, man, I wish I could have made this game. I wish I could have been there to watch them come up with it because it's such an adventure to create a game like this, and I just see the heart that went into this game, and I respect it so much. But then playing it is also a lot of fun for an Atari game. It's... Oh, look, here's a bridge that lets you basically go through walls. It's pretty interesting. And you can pick up the bridge. Man, this square is, is stacked. He's ripped. He's got that Arnie build. He just pick up a whole bridge and carry it like it's nothing. He just... He, he killed a dragon with the back end of a sword. He's, he's got some real muscles. But really... Adventure, what I love about this game is just, it feels so free. When you look at games now, they funnel you into such a little small path. Like, you have to do this. You have to do exactly this. And even modern open world games just feel so funneled. Garen of Auto feels like a series of funnels with a big world around it. I mean, that's what this is too, but it just benefits from being so much older for me because... So much of it is left to my imagination because all I see is a square. For all for all we're concerned, the square has no gender. The square has no name. The square. What's the square's backstory? Did the square have a family? Did the square's mother die when the square was little? Did the square uh, have to face these dragons in nightmares? Like what? Like that's what I love about it is that it leaves so much to the player that you feel the adventure coming from within you rather than being pushed onto you by the game. And so Adventure is a lot of fun, and I definitely recommend it. This is a must-have for anybody who wants an Atari. Missile Command! <laughs> Missile Command. Love this game. I don't think I ever played the arcade version, but 
I think I've played it on an emulator before. I don't remember. I might. I think I might have played it before because I've played a version that was not this version. And either way, this version is a really good game. Despite the simplistic graphics, the game itself functions great. I think the arcade version used a trackball, but which would probably be better for the game, but this version uses a joystick, of course, and it's a challenge, and I didn't think I would put this so high, but it turned out to be a lot of fun, and it turns out I'm kind of good at it, and I don't know, it's just, it's fun because, I mean, obviously, if you've played it before, then you know this, but if you haven't, when you shoot, there's a delay between when your missile hits the area that you shoot at and, you know, when you fire it. So when you, when it hits, it also, there's a delay for the explosion, so, so it's an interesting mechanic, and it's basically, it's a multitasking game. You have to know to, like, where to hit, uh, like, you have to know to hit in a certain spot ahead of the, mis the missile that you're trying to hit, and then you also have to know to hit it a bit early, and you also have to know, like, timing, but you also have to be aware of multiple missiles going on at the same time, and it becomes pretty hectic as it goes on, but when I was recording the footage, this was my first time really sitting down and really playing through this game, because I had it, but I hadn't really played through it. So when I finally sat there and really played it, I wanted to keep playing it after I recorded the footage, because it was so much fun. But I had to film more footage for this review, so, I mean, I had to move on, but, like, I was bummed to move on. That's a sign that it's a really great game, when you want to play more. And that's what's great about it, is that this game benefits from the repetitiveness because it just ramps up in the difficulty. It just keeps doing the same thing, but it just gets harder and harder. And that's a lot of fun. And so, the game is on par with any arcade game. As a port, it's as fun as playing a game in the arcade. So, that's one of the best things that an Atari game can succeed with. Uh, is because back then it was basically all just you know, arcade games, so, as in, so, an Atari game should function as an arcade game at its best, and when this can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with real arcade cabinet games, that's a sign that this is a really good home console game for the time, and so, this definitely deserves to be high on the list, if you're getting an Atari, get this game, great game, definitely recommend it. I had a blast playing it, pun intended. So, yeah, Missile Command. I command you to not missile. Alright, abort the joke. This sucks. Centipede. I love this game so much. When I talk about having played games in the arcade, I've played the, my top four most played games. Number one is definitely Miss Pac-Man. Number two is probably Donkey Kong, the original Donkey Kong. Number three would either be Robotron or Centipede. And Centipede is a very fun arcade game. It's not as good as a, a home console game, but only because it lacks the trackball. Otherwise, this is not very far off from being as good as the original Centipede. Centipede is a very fun game, and what makes it fun is the dynamic of the game is kind of different from a lot of, like, I mean, you you might see this and immediately think Space Invaders, but it's very different from a game like Space Invaders, because the centipede bounces off all these squares, and so you can trap the centipede, and uh, your speed of fire is based off of when your bullet hits something, so basically you can get into this groove where you can very quickly kill the centipede and that can build up points really fast. It's a game that allows a lot of freedom for the skill in the game. It allows a lot of freedom for you to learn how to get good. It's not It's not once you get good it just becomes the same thing over and over again. There's a dynamic to it where when you kill the centipede, it builds more squares, which changes where you need to fire, and it changes how you need to fire. And then the little spider guy comes around, and he's like, Hey, I want to chill out down here at the bottom and hang out with you. You seem like a cool little, little square. 
You seem cool. And then you're like, fuck off. Like, I'm trying to shoot this goddamn centipede and you're in the way trying to trying to hang out, trying to chillax. Like, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the mood to chillax right now. Maybe catch me at a different time. So the spider is just showing up, doing his thing. And then the, the level changes colors. I think that's a lot of fun. So basically, the dynamics of the game is a lot of fun. One of my favorite things about this game that's definitely present in the home console version is the sound design. I didn't talk a lot about sound design in the previous games, but this one, it's very important because arcade games weren't always very musical. They didn't tend to have music while you played the game. It usually was just sound effects. And Centipede forms a nice compromise where the sound effects are themselves kind of musical. It fil it creates this thumping sound, and then the little spider comes and has like a little theme song that creates a little tiny song. And what I love about that is when you play. See, when I play Atari games, I always think about it as late night, and it's in a dark room, and you're just your eyes are glued to the screen, and there's all these bright colors with this black backdrop and then you just hear the sound effects and you just play to these sound effects and it's a very it's a very strong image when you do that and i like that because when you're playing it it's atari games are almost kind of depressing because of the lack of music but this one's so much more vibrant because the music is incorporated into the sound design so when you're playing it there's a rhythm to the gameplay, and there's a rhythm to the sound design, which creates a more musical quality to both playing it and watching it. So, when you're playing it late at night, it gives this strong feeling of, of like, it's almost hypnotic. And that's what I really love about the best Atari games, is that you get into a rhythm of playing it where it becomes almost hypnotic. And the change of colors and the, the dynamic of the gameplay, Centipede is a very hypnotic game to play. And that's why it's so high on the list, is because I can just get lost and play this game for a long time. I could probably play this for, like, hours. If I was keeping track of high scores, I would definitely be able to play this for at least an hour straight. That's just how much I enjoy this game, even as a port, let alone the, the arcade version, which is so much fun. So, Centipede is another must-own. Anything from this point on, I would consider a must-own Atari game. Donkey Kong Jr., yes! I um, really love the arcade version of this game. Another one of my favorite arcade games was another one of my most played, maybe number five on my list of most played arcade games. Not as good as Donkey Kong in the arcade, not as good as the original Donkey Kong, but the port version of both games, this actually is better. I know I made a fuss in the last game about how um, the Donkey Kong port for the original Donkey Kong here was ass, and this one, thankfully, is not ass. It's actually pretty fun. I mean, look at DK Jr. He's way more... He rocks the look in this game. He rocks the look. DK looked like shit. He looked like literal shit in Donkey Kong. But in this one, DK Jr., he's got it going. He's got it going on. He looks ready to party. He looks ready to get funkalicious. Like, DK Jr., is great. He looks great, and he plays great, and he has a great game surrounding him. Maybe Mario just did not work good as a protagonist in the Atari era, but yeah. So, the game is, I think, in this one, it's three levels. See, I'm actually really bad at the arcade version of DK Jr., so I don't remember if there are more than three levels, but I would assume since there's more than three levels in Donkey Kong Arcade, that there would be more levels in Donkey Kong Jr. Arcade, so this version is just three levels. But that's better than two levels, and the levels themselves are a lot of fun. And when you actually get into the rhythm of playing them over and over again, it doesn't get tiresome like it does on the arcade port, uh, the Atari port of Donkey Kong. One major complaint is... Uh, the crocodiles, the crocoducks, the croco fuck you. The 
these little dickweeds are uh, really hard to look at. Like, it's really hard to spot them. I mean, you're seeing it, and it probably looks even harder to spot, but even on my big TV, it is hard to see where they are when you're playing. So you have to be really mindful of that while playing. But aside from that, the game is a very fun game to play, and even though it doesn't play as well as Donkey Kong Jr. on the arcade, it plays so differently that it's a unique experience that is worth checking out. Because, I don't know, there's just something about Donkey Kong Jr. Just watching him fumble around, he looks, he's balling, he's got it going on. He's pole climbing and he's doing his thing and Mario's just sitting there laughing at him like, fuck you, I got your dad here and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna let him go because he stole my girlfriend. And you're like, fuck you, that's my dad. Me and him used to share bananas together. We were the, the we were the pack, we were the team. The real question is, whatever happened to Donkey Kong Jr.? Why did he stop showing up in Donkey Kong games? I'm a big fan of the Donkey Kong series. And he's just not around anymore. I miss him. He was fun. This game's fun. The arcade version's fun and the port's fun. And he just needs more time in the sun. I mean, sheesh. You didn't have to cut him off. He's like the best. He's the, he's the best arcade hero of a generation. So, I don't know. Uh, Donkey Kong Jr., a lot of fun. Fun to play over and over again. Much better than the uh, Donkey Kong original uh, port. Not as good as the arcade version, but it's definitely worth checking out as a unique experience. I had to get it for $10, which is more than I usually get an Atari game for, but it was definitely worth it. I had a blast playing this game, and I think if you were to play it, you would too. Yep. This is happening. This is real. E.T. at number three for my top 20 list of greatest Atari games. This is number three. Here's the deal. This game is a lot of fun. If you think that this is the worst game ever made, you don't know a lot about bad games. I've played a lot of bad games, and I've played games that were a lot worse than this. If you think this is bad, try playing Turning Point Fall of Liberty. Trust me, you'll regret it. So, E.T. is your E.T., and it's basically just like the movie. You remember the movie, right? I mean, you just... E.T. lands in a forest... And he just walks around and he falls into a pit, just like in the movie, and he stretches his neck out, and then he flies out, and then he picks up Reese's Pieces on the ground. He's like, hmm, I'm going to eat this. Oh, fuck, I got to go home. I just realized I'm on the wrong planet. So then he decides to go home, and he's like, oh, well, I better find all these pieces of a phone. And he goes and he picks them up, and then voila, he gets home. Meanwhile, these weird asshole creepy predator guys are coming around trying to offer you candy and like hey come over here and then they steal your fucking phone and you're like what and then they put you in into the parthenon which was definitely that definitely happened in the movie that was my favorite scene in the movie by the way and then et gets out of that pit he gets into the pit and it's the lowest it's his lowest point it's the lowest point of the movie and then he gets out and it's so victorious and then you realize you still need three pieces and you're like fuck this game and you turn it off and you play something else no but really et is a lot of fun of course falling into pits can be seen as annoying i don't think it's annoying personally but i could see why it's annoying but that said it's another open roaming game, and that's a fun idea. And sure, the map makes no sense. I still don't understand it. But when you actually figure out how to play, it's not as hard or as obnoxious as you think it is. So here's the deal. When you get into the pit, you a lot of major complaint is that you fall back in. Actually, you only fall back in because you assume that when you get out of the pit, you need to keep moving up. But really, what you should be mo moving is to the left or right, or more specifically, down. Because when you move up, while after you get out of the pit, ET stops extending his neck, and since you're not out of the out of the area where the pit is, you fall back in, and so you're supposed to be moving down or to the left or right when you get out of the pit, because then you can continue to move and you can finally get out. Also, if you're if you're moving and you press the button, you can run, which I'm not, I'm not sure a lot of people know about. So at the top, there's these directions. the The arrows tell you what 
which um, screen they're going to send you to next if you press the button. All the things at the top tell you what will happen if you press the button. When it has that arrow when you're in the pit, it's saying this will get you out of the pit. When it has the arrows when you're on the land, that says this will t send you to that screen, you know, the, the screen to the left. And then when you see a question mark, this one says this will tell you if there's a piece of the phone nearby. So it becomes easy to find. Actually, one of the interesting things about this game is that there are difficulty settings. Not a lot of people that consider this the worst game ever made know about the difficulty settings. Uh, I didn't set it to the lower difficulty for this review, but you can actually turn it so that the bad guys don't appear at all, which makes it easy enough to beat, and I like the challenge, so I tend to keep them around, but... Um, Basically, you just want to avoid the guys at all costs, and you can do that by teleporting to the next screen as quickly as possible, and whenever you see them again, just get the fuck out of there, and then try to find the piece of the phone uh, that you were near uh, later on. So, basically, it's actually a pretty challenging and inventive game, it's just that the pits are pretty annoying. I can understand why those would be annoying. But overall, it's actually not that bad of a game. It's a fun game. It's a very fun game by Atari standards, and it's a fun game overall, even transcending Atari standards. So I do not think that it's the worst game ever made. I don't even consider this a bad game. But having said all of that, I understand why people hate it. It's just that, oh, look, he, he raised the flower, and there's a little smiley face. Oh, that's the best part of the whole game. But yeah, I understand why people hate it. It's just that it comes from a perspective of people that are not familiar with other Atari games. When you've actually played a lot of Atari games, this does not stand out as bad. It actually stands out as good. So, I mean, I showed you some of the worst games on the list. This is definitely better than uh, Pole Position. Pole Position is just boring. It's definitely better than Haunted House. Haunted House, like, I can't even tell what I'm supposed to do at all. But this game, once you figure out what you're supposed to do, it's actually a lot of fun it's a pretty enjoyable experience especially because of the running mechanic because you can just zoom around like at 90 miles an hour imagine that et running 90 miles an hour just imagine et running with his feet on the freeway and you just see an alien and it's like oh fuck yeah overall it's actually a pretty fun game it's actually decent it's good it's a good game number three on this list for a reason it is enjoyable I recommend, okay, here's, I'm outing myself as the biggest nerd ever. We actually, my sister and whoever helped paid, I think, a hundred bucks to get an Atari just so that I could play an official version of E.T. There was a nearby video game store that had eight cartridges of E.T. Each one was a buck. So it only cost a dollar to play plus a hundred dollars. So I paid a hundred dollars to play this. I don't regret it. That's the thing. It It's a landmark of history, and it's actually an enjoyable game on top of that. It's an enjoyable experience to have played it for real. Not because it's like the best game ever. It's not worth $100 as a game, but as an experience, it is worth time and effort because I don't like... I don't like emulators. I don't like emulators because I've played games on real console and on emulators and then noticed how significantly an emulator can change your experience. It breaks the experience with E.T. and it breaks the experience with Superman 64, which I may have to review someday because I'm one to defend Superman 64. I also think Superman 64 is a good game, honestly speaking. Not a great game, a good game. So anyways... E.T., when you experience it for real, is actually enjoyable. When you experience it under the guise of, it's the worst game ever, and when you play on an emulator and you don't figure out about the difficulty settings, you don't figure out the controls, when you don't take the time to invest into this game like most people do, because honestly it doesn't look like it's worth it, when you actually give that time, it's not bad. It's not the best game ever, but it is my third favorite Atari game that I own. And that's saying something because I was addicted to Centipede, and I was addicted to Missile Command. And yet, I still like this more. So overall, fun game. Great Atari game. I recommend it. Fuck the haters. If there was any game that I was most surprised to see the placement of on this list in a positive way 
it would be Mega Mania. I was shocked to find out that this is my second favorite Atari game. I did not think a space shooter would be this high, especially because space shooters tend to be so samey that you eventually get sick of it. Gorf, for example, Gorf, is not very far off from being Space Invaders, which was pretty low on my list. But this ended up being super high, and it's hard to explain, but I'm going to try to explain it. So, you're watching me play it. I'm actually pretty good at this game. So, watch the firing mechanic. You'll notice that as I move, as my spaceship moves, the bullet that I fire moves in the same direction that I do. You can curve your bullet. This is wanted. This is some bullet time stuff. So, you're, fighter, you're fighting these Tinker Toys, and uh, the movement of the enemies is really interesting because it becomes a challenge of trying to hit it with that curved bullet thing. You can actually turn the curved bullet off if you change it, if you do a different game mode, but I prefer the curved bullet. So, there's just something really fun about the the rhythm of this game. Of course, it's a space shooter, but in terms of gameplay, it's not a generic space shooter at all. It's a very outstanding space shooter. Look at look at the pattern on this enemy, for example. The the enemy will go beyond the screen and show up on the other side, and then there's rows of them, and they alternate directions. And of course, they're also firing. And of course, they can actually get low enough to hit you directly, which becomes a game of you have to dodge, you have to dodge the ones that are too low to hit, but low enough that they can hit you. And then you also have to be ready for the bullets up above, and then you also have to be firing at the same time. So the game overall is a very intricate game when you actually play it. It looks really simple because it's an Atari game, but it is Mega Mania. I mean, the name says it. It's Mega and it's Mania. It's both. It's great. And I think this is possibly my favorite space shooter ever because there is not a whole lot of space shooters that I play, but this is definitely one of the best. And it doesn't seem like it. You just have to play it for yourself to understand. But it is a very addicting game. And I love this game. I love playing it. So Mega Mania, highly recommended. Probably a very underrated Atari game. I don't know. I haven't seen like lists of best Atari games. But most of the time I don't hear about this game. I had never heard of it before I played it. So that says something. It's worth checking out. Very fun game. If you're interested in Atari games, I su suggest it. If you're interested in space shooters, I suggest it. So, great game. Moving on to number one. Got to do my best. Uh, Got to do my best announcer voice. Number one. Number one. I was genuinely surprised to see Mega Mania at number two. I was not at all surprised to see Berserk at number one. I knew from the start of this list that Berserk would be my number one. I've never played the arcade version. I might have played an emulator version of it, I don't know, but I've never had a chance to play the arcade version. I would love to try the arcade version someday, but just as its own experience, the arcade port the Atari port of Berserk is incredible. There's just something so great about it. It's a maze shooter, and it feels like part Tron, part Doom. It's, I don't know, I just love it. And I love the omnidirectional firing, omnidirectional, more like a firing in like six directions. I love the the complete idiot enemy AI that can just kill itself for no reason. I love the I love the usage of like I like the way that this enemy for example he's firing and there's like a rhythm to it, which again creates like a song within the gameplay. I love the navigation. I love that you don't know what you're about to get with any new room. I love how you can spawn right in front of a bunch of guys and you're like, oh shit, and you gotta shoot them immediately, like right there. I love how you can like totally miss somebody, but then you have to get the perfect shot and you have to line it up. Like, it's not always a hectic game, but it's definitely a fun game and a a rewarding game and an addicting game. When you play this game, when you start it, you never want to stop it. It can become really fun. So, 
ultimately, when I play this game, I didn't... At, when I first played it, I didn't think it would be my favorite Atari game, but it became the only one that I kept coming back to repeatedly. Like, if I have the Atari out, I will play through any of the games once or twice, and then I'll play through Berserk like 13 times, because it is just so, like, infectious. You just keep wanting to play. I don't know what it is. Something about this game just really hits. We all know, if you know about Berserk, then you know about the supposed deaths that the game caused. The game caused the deaths possibly of two, I think, 19-year-old kids that were going for the world record. It was the arcade version. Um, the reason why is because this game has 64,000 mazes, the Atari version has 64,000 rooms just like the arcade version does, and when you're sitting there, this is a marathon. You do not stop. You have to keep playing. You have to neglect your health for it. Combining that with Evil Auto, you get a heart attack. And Evil Auto is considered one of the scariest villains in all of gaming for this reason, because he is the only enemy that has actually killed people. And when I played the Atari version, I was bummed to find out that Evil Auto was not showing up. I later learned that there are different game modes, and you can play a game mode that does have Evil Auto. And that's what I'm showing you now. Evil Auto has been showing up. Evil Auto totally changes the dynamic of play. So there are basically two versions of this game for the Atari. There's the version I played and the version that I recommend playing first with no Evil Auto, where it's just a maze shooter that takes a while. And then there's the version with Evil Auto, which is a frantic nightmare of a game. But it is so much fun. Evil Auto totally changes the way that the game works, because Evil Auto will show up whether you're ready or not. And the, more, the less people that are on screen, the faster he will come at you. And, of course, he's a bouncing smiley face, which is creepy in its own right. So you, you want to try to get as much points as you can, so you want to try to kill as many people as you can. Of course, you could just do a pacifist run, but I don't think you get any points doing that. So either way, what happens is you're playing against Evil Auto. You're trying to get the enemies on screen but then evil auto shows up and you're like oh well you now you have to get the fuck out you don't stand a chance it's almost like you're fighting the terminator almost it's like you will not win you must leave you cannot kill evil auto i think there are game types where you can kill him but he keeps coming back i don't know i haven't played that but the invincible evil auto is the one that i like to play so when he's invincible you just get the fuck out and you're you leave the room and it becomes terrifying especially when you play it alone at night with the lack of music and in the dark and you're you're sleep deprived and you're playing and you're addicted and then evil auto keeps showing up it's like you feel this sense of dread and this sense of pacing like you know amnesia is what everybody goes to but fuck amnesia berserk is the horror game of the fucking three centuries it's it is a very tense game to play, and honestly, it scares me more than Amnesia ever did, or any modern horror game, just because you have to balance all those elements. You have to be getting out, you have, well, you, you, wanna, you wanna be near an exit, you want to kill as many people as you can, but you don't wanna get hit by evil auto, so you have to be aware to hit them fast and then get out before he gets in. And so you're balancing all these elements, and that's what I think the best arcade games let you do. That's what Robotron does, that's what Centipede does, that's what Pac-Man does it to a smaller extent, and that's what Berserk does. And Berserk is just a very rewarding experience because it's so hectic and it's so tense, and you really, I mean, you might not even enjoy playing it, but you can't turn it off because you just have to keep playing. And that's what I love about this game is you just feel that sense that you have to keep going. And so I just keep playing and I keep playing. It. And that's why it's my number one Atari game. Because after all is said and done, I might have more fun playing other games, but I don't come back to them like I do Berserk. Berserk just drives something out of me while I play it. And it truly is one of the best games I've ever played in any console. I think if you are trying to find 
great Atari games, Berserk is should be your top priority, but that's just my opinion. 